It is just always great uh, to see a community come together and embrace the spirit of entrepreneurialism. And um, it, everything needs a spark, and you've got to start somewhere. And um, I've watched with um, great satisfaction what's happened in New York City over the last few years, because I was going to give a little talk about what's that, but um, Barry asked me to do something a little bit different. Um, but it's really exploded, as, as most of you know. And it's got to start somewhere, and it starts with things like Connecticut Innovation Center. Uh, so, uh, Barry, um, on behalf of everybody here, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, um, and I'm, I'm psyched to be here. Um, so Barry asked me to give a little bit of uh, a talk on Metamorphic, our history, uh, my path into uh, venture capital from what he calls the dark side, um, <laughs> and, um, you know, the kinds of things that... Uh, we've done that get us excited uh, in terms of investments um, and kind of what makes us different, what we're looking for. Um, so we'll, we'll start with that. And a um, little bit of an overview. Um, Metamorphic is a seed early stage fund that invests in what we call transactional media. And I'll get into that in a little bit uh, later in depth. Uh, but it's basically the convergence between digital media and digital commerce. Um, we are a seed and early stage fund. Um, <coughs> And we are investing in companies that we believe have real business models, which uh, tends to be a little bit different than some of the other uh, venture investing that goes uh, on out there, which is largely B2C, often without a business model, which we're not all that attracted to. Um, <clears throat> so we are focused on building real businesses. Um, we're managed by three investment professionals. And I think one of the things that really differentiates us um, is the concentration and the effort that we put in as partners with our portfolio companies. Um, so there are some funds that make lots of investments. Um, that's fine. Uh, the problem with that is that <coughs> it prevents the partners from spending too much time with any of their portfolio companies. So we tend to make fewer investments. Um, and the reason is that we really commit our time, our effort, our network, our LPs to helping grow these companies uh, as fast as they can possibly grow. Obviously, we're, we're headquartered in New York, uh, but we also have a very strong LP and advisor network out in the valley, and we tend to cross over between the two uh, geographies in terms of making our investments. Um, <coughs> let's get into the team, and, and which leads us into our uh, uh, history. Um, I always like to say that Metamorphic, in a way, is the accidental VC. Um, <coughs> I really didn't start out to start a VC fund. Um, what happened uh, was in the late uh, 90s, I had backed um, a partner who's no longer with us, but an entrepreneur here in, in New York um, who was building a digital publishing business. And like everything in the late 90s, it took off. And we were going to go public, and we had the S1 filed, H&Q was going to go with us, and March of 2000, NASDAQ cracks. That was all she wrote for coming public. We ended up selling that company at the end of 2002 to two different buyers, neither of whom wanted our real estate, took our people, waved us goodbye, um, and the entrepreneur and I were left with a large piece of real estate that we were trying to figure out what to do with. <laughs> and he and I started uh, seed investing and incubating out of the real estate that we had. We didn't even call it incubators back then. It was just a piece of real estate. Um, we were fortunate uh, in that the uh, investments that we made ended up being huge home runs. And we exited one for 10x, another one for 24x within three years. One of our co-investors um, uh, was dumb enough to think we knew what we were doing, came to us and said, would you manage some of our family money? And that was the beginning of, of Metamorphic. But Metamorphic was really small. That was 2006, about $3 million that we raised at that point in time. Um, by 2008, we saw something very, very special going on in New York City, and um, I was joined at that time uh, by David Hirsch, 
Um, <coughs> and he and I uh, are basically the co-founders of Metamorphic. David spent eight years as one of the first Google employees uh, here in New York. Uh, he and a fellow named Tim Armstrong, who's now the CEO of AOL, uh, were the first two non-Mountain View employees hired to build out the whole revenue side of Google. And I think Google was doing about $2 million in revenue uh, when, when they joined. Uh, and eight years later, um, they were doing a little bit more than that. So uh, David and I hooked up. Um, we raised a small fund in 2009 um, after the, uh, the Lehman dust settled and uh, of about $20 million. And uh, we've been investing uh, that ever since. And now we are just about done uh, raising our uh, second fund, which would be about $50 million. Um, and uh, we are joined by a third uh, associate, Ben Crawl, who joined us uh, this year. So it's, it's really the three of us. What makes, part, what makes us special in part is, is our LP base. Um, and uh, we're very proud of our LP base. Um, it is non-traditional in nature. Yes, we have a handful of institutions. But by and large, most of our LPs are senior executives, founders, entrepreneurs, technologists, biz dev uh, professionals from a group of the most important companies in our uh, ecosystem where we are playing uh, every day. Um, and so these people are very invested in us, both as investors and advisors uh, in what we're doing. And they really distinguish us in terms of accelerating the growth of our portfolio companies. Um, <laughs> so this is a big part of the metamorphic secret sauce. We've been investing in a thesis, uh, if you will, that I mentioned called transactional media. And the idea was that digital media and payments, commerce, which had been siloed, were all starting to converge together. Um, and they were going to drive commerce, particularly consumer retail commerce, which is about a $4 trillion spend in the United States, um, <coughs> which was a big pond to play in. Um, and so we are investing in a group of technology companies that are driving, enhancing, and participating in this transactional media that we see in that $4 trillion pool of, uh, <coughs> of spend that's going on. That's just here in the United States. So Barry asked me uh, to go through a handful of our companies. Um, and I apologize if I'm going quickly. I want to leave a lot of time for uh, Q&A uh, tonight, not bore you too much with uh, the, the metamorphic story. But, um, and before I even get into the, the, um, the first company, Chango, what we're looking for uh, when we invest is really what I call the, the racehorse, um, racetrack uh, uh, analogy. <laughs> so we're looking for great jockeys who are riding in, in Big stakes races, so Kentucky Derby, not at Yonkers, um, <laughs> and uh, riding thoroughbred horses. So they are building unique products that are defensible over a long period of time. Um, those are the three most important things we're, we're looking at with the jockey and the size of the market uh, being the most important thing. Uh, and Chango is a good example of, of this type of company. So Chango was started by a guy named Chris Sikornik. Chris was a uh, three-time serial entrepreneur. His first uh, company was an utter disaster. We like that. You learn from that. His next two companies were huge home runs. Chris came to us with the idea that Google, which generates about $30 billion a year in revenues off of uh, this idea called search, um, <coughs> might be vulnerable. And the reason search is uh, so lucrative is embedded in someone's search is their intent to buy something. So for example, if you're searching for hotels in Hawaii, probable that you're going to take a trip to Hawaii sometime soon, and Weston Hotel would like to know that. Um, and they want to get in front of you, and they're willing to pay a lot to come up first in those search results. Um, as opposed to that is display advertising. So you know all that advertising that sits on the side of most of your websites, may be relevant to you, may not. Trades dirt cheap because there's nothing such as intent embedded in that advertising that's going on. Chris had the idea, well, what if I could figure out intent from other sources, get by display advertising, which is actually a much better and more interesting ad unit than the single lines of text that Google feeds you. 
We said, that's pretty cool. This is a $30 billion market. <coughs> Google wouldn't even notice you before you were a billion dollars. And sure enough, that's what's ha been happening. So he built the uh, data sources. Under the hood of, of Chango is a big data company that just consumes masses and masses of data to determine what you're interested, what your intent is in real time, then reserves it up through a marketer through a display ad buy. And sure enough, uh, Chango has, has taken off, gone to the races, probably do about $50 million this year from when we invested in 2010, nothing, um, and about 100, 150 million uh, next year and possibly go public at that point in time. That is a good example of where we're playing. Some of you may know this company called Indiegogo. Um, it's a crowdfunding uh, company. And uh, again, the reason we backed it was a guy named Slava Rubin um, had been a very successful entrepreneur uh, previously and came to us with the idea of Indiegogo. Kickstarter had, had uh, started uh, then, um, but Slava had uh, cleverly built his business very capital efficiently and he had done something that Kickstarter hadn't done which was he had gone to 200 uh, countries and passed through all of the um, regulatory hurdles that one needs to move money uh, across borders. And Kickstarter was strictly in the United States at that point in time. Um, why was this interesting? Well, every year, $300 billion is donated by Americans to a variety of uh, causes. $300 billion. And, and that's done th without the help of the internet. So Indiegogo and, and, and Kickstarter had come up with the idea of collecting money uh, via the use of the internet and combining it with social media to distribute those causes and really were the first two to do it and have opened up a gigantic market um, <clears throat> that is just burgeoning right now, uh, proving out that there are people willing to, to use these platforms to raise money for causes, for products, for music, movies, uh, healthcare problems that they're uh, facing. Um, and really these two companies have, have defined the market and are proving that, you know, that $300 billion market, there's really no reason that uh, several billion dollars shouldn't be raised every year off of those platforms. The business model here is that uh, each of the companies takes about five, six percent of the revenues uh, that are uh, gathered uh, from the monies, um, which is actually lower than what charities pay money raisers um, by substantially. Um, so they are earning their due uh, here. Movable Inc. Um, is an email technology company. And uh, the idea here again was back a proven winner entrepreneur. Um, <coughs> Vivek Sharma uh, had gone through two startups, although he had himself had never been the, the founder, he was the uh, lead salesperson for uh, one of the companies and had an engineering degree by uh, background. Uh, so Vivek had uh, identified a problem with email. Um, when you go to a website, all the data when you open up a website is current as of the moment that you open up that website. So if you're on kayak.com, all of those prices are real-time prices that you see as the moment that you open it. If kayak, however, sends you an email about something, when you open it, it is only current as of the moment they sent it. And you may not open it for days, in which case the prices may have changed. That's a big problem for email marketers, especially if any of their data has changed from the moment they've sent it to the moment you might open it. Um, and so a lot of people tried to crack this code in the past, um, have failed. Uh, Vivek and his team uh, figured out how to do it in massive scale um, and uh, are, are taking off. We just raised uh, $10 million from, uh, from Intel Capital uh, at a substantial uh, premium to where we uh, have invested. Last one, uh, just an example. And um, again, I want to try to leave a lot of time for uh, Q&A tonight. Uh, Lendo, um, once again, um, a serial entrepreneur um, that we've known for a long time, has had great uh, successes and a handful of failures uh, as well. Um, so again, great learnings. Uh, we, we never shy away from an entrepreneur who has uh, not succeeded uh, in his past. That is, that is not a uh, scarlet letter.
But uh, Jeff had an idea that in emerging countries, there was a great middle class uh, that was burgeoning through the systems, and yet they had no access to credit. Um, and the, part of the reason they have no access to credit is that unlike the United States, we have very sophisticated credit scoring systems. And we collect all this data about your payment history, your workplace, your assets, um, your prior uh, credit uh, history. And so we've got tons of data in which to score you and uh, lenders can make decisions about whether they want to grant you credit, at what price, how much. None of that exists in places like Mexico and Brazil and uh, the Philippines and Indonesia, for example. Only the upper class have access to, uh, to credit and it's based on um, collateral. <coughs> so um, what does exist in, in these uh, economies is heavy, heavy usage of social media. And so Jeff's idea was um, taken from an old adage, J.P. Morgan, that a man's character is more important than his collateral. And through using heavy duty data science, he could sift through a person's usage of social media and determine what kind of person uh, they really were. Were they a good credit? Were their friend, who, who do they hang out with? Are their friends responsible uh, people or a bunch of deadbeats? Um, and they've created this whole scoring system that is being used today in the Philippines, Mexico, and Colombia, which are our first three markets, but ultimately it'll be all of Asia and all of South America to grant credit to this burgeoning group of people coming into the middle class there. Credit is a gigantic industry. Uh, it might be the largest industry in, in our entire economy, actually. Um, <laughs> so that's, again, why we were attracted to, uh, to Lendo. Last, last slide. Um, you know, what makes Metamorphic special? Um, <laughs> we have a checkbook, just like anybody else. That can't be it. Um, we like to think it's really the value that we add to the portfolio companies. And uh, this is an example of uh, what we try to do almost once a month. So uh, Peter Soxy is the CMO um, of Macy's, and uh, he's one of our advisors. And um, we started doing this at his suggestion, where we bring in a group of our portfolio companies and we do demo days with brands and retailers uh, almost once a month. Uh, Macy's was the first uh, that we did that. Um, once Peter, Peter sort of gave us the idea, we ran with it and we do it uh, basically every month with a different brand or a different retailer. This is invaluable to our uh, portfolio companies. Um, of the 10 uh, companies we put in front of Macy's, six of them are now doing business uh, with Macy's. Might have taken them a year or two to get that account. Um, and so having that reference account uh, lets them uh, take off that much faster. Um, so that's really part of our secret sauce and we think uh, differentiates us. Um, so that's really the end of, you know, sort of the overview on, on Metamorphic. Um, and I really wanted to leave a lot of time for Q&A of, of all sorts. With a list of 50 companies that they want to meet um, in order to accelerate their business. And we will work like the devil over the next 90 days to connect them to those 50 companies. Um, so that's step one. Um, the second piece is um, recruiting, um, because building your team is really the, um, one of the most important things uh, to building any high quality, um, high growth company. And so we spend a lot of time uh, helping identify candidates, um, and then just as importantly, interviewing those candidates on behalf of uh, the, the entrepreneurs, and making sure that they, they're putting together a, a first class uh, middle management team. And then, of course, as time goes on, we're getting involved in, you know, the overall strategy. Does the original strategy make sense? Do we need to shift it? Um, <coughs> and then the capital raising uh, piece of the business where we're leveraging a fairly large network of other, you know, like-minded investors, seed funds, Series A, Series B funds uh, that we have, uh, you know, contact with uh, to get the companies further financed. So, so you're, you're pretty active in terms of making sure they hire people that are going to get them to the next level. Absolutely. Right. Um. And, and um, so, so let's talk about just a couple of the startups that, that you mentioned. Actually, I'm going to talk with one that you didn't mention that you know I'm a huge fan of, and anyone who's spending time with the, here at the Innovation Center has heard me uh, or heard us uh, playing music across 
a service called Songza, S-O-N-G-Z-A. Uh, it's one of, uh, one of the metamorphic investments. And if you haven't experienced Songza, I, I'm a big fan. What, what they do versus Pandora or uh, Last.fm or, or others is, is that the song lists on Songza are actually curated and created by professional uh, music people. So a guy that scored all of Scorsese's movies makes several playlists that you can listen to on Songza. And his playlists are pretty darn great. And when you're listening to it, you really feel like you're catching up on some stuff you haven't heard. Or earlier we were just to, listening to, I think it's called Skaville, which is, you know, I love early reggae and early ska. And these are songs I've never heard before, including a reggae version of Take Five. I would have never heard that in my life um, if it wasn't for Songza. Now, when you and I talked earlier, there's Songza is, is a funny investment, right? Because it's such a crowded space. Could you just talk about what's going on there, despite right. the fact that I might like it? doesn't make sure it even... So, so Songza decided that um, music wasn't just music. Um, music was about lifestyle and what you're doing at any given moment. Whether you're cooking, you're exercising, you're chilling out after work um, from a hard day, um, you're doing something and there is appropriate music for the appropriate activity. That was the first concept vis-a-vis -vis consumers part of it. Then you have to turn it into a business, right? Um, and what songs had never tried to do was sell music uh, because, and, and meta, meta, one of Metamorphic's sort of views of the music industry is music's a great business, not, just not for selling music, um, but it's great for selling other things. Um, and so if you're working out, well, Nike wants to get in front of you when you're working out. And so this is part of our transactional media thesis that we call contextual commerce. Um, <laughs> William Sonova wants to be in front of you when you're cooking and listening to, you know, one of our you know, song lists for, you know, cooking. And, and the list just keeps going on. So what they're trying to create is what they call a contextual commerce engine right. uh, in terms of turning into a business. They're not trying to sell music. Well, we, we, we really like it here, and um, I, I recommend any of you that are uh, out there listening to uh, music on your computers or your phones or your tablets, it's, it's definitely worth listening to. Um, uh, the, next, the next question I, I had for you um, was, you, you know, just, it, it seemed like two, two of the four or so you, you, you brought up were actually finance companies, mm -hmm. right? In, Indiegogo and, and Lendo, mm -hmm. it, you know, and, and, and I know your thesis is a lot around digital commerce, but this is a different type of digital commerce. It's not really what one would think about within that thesis. Well, we, in our view of digital commerce includes payments and finance um, as part of that. So it does fit our, you know, our overall macro thesis, uh -huh. uh, to tell you the truth. So you're, so you're, le you're less, content is, is one element of, of what you think about, but it's, it's broadly digital commerce. Uh, yes. And the, fin uh, how, and the finance stuff, is, is that, is that a, the, the biggest part of your portfolio, or is that sort of in the middle? No, I would say that data and analytics and big data companies are really the, the, the core of most of our portfolio wow. companies. And they may be um, effectuating their product um, in, in what might be viewed as an ad tech uh, kind of play. But under the hood, just like Chango, there's a massive amount of data massaging going on right. um, in order to create insights about each and every one of us as, of, of us as a consumer. Excellent. Um, I, uh, one other question for you before uh, I, I, um, I turn it over to the crowd, and I know there's a bunch of people with, with a bunch of questions, so we'll get to them in a second. So uh, we talked about this, th this over lunch. Here's what a lot of people in the room want to know. How do I meet a VC? How do I get my story? Because I've got the best darn startup idea in the world. How do I get it in front of Mark Michelle? Right. Um, so what I told Peter is that I don't think I've ever funded a deal where a VC approached me directly, um, where it hadn't come from a trusted introduction from somebody that I knew. And the reason is that if I just opened the floodgates, all I would do is take meetings with you know, hopeful entrepreneurs that want to get their, their companies funded. Unfortunately, not every company merits you know, venture backing. And there has to be some initial screening for me um, and my partners. And, and by the way, every venture capital fund that I know of operates this way. 
Right. Um, <laughs> so um, my advice to all of you is find a way in that isn't direct. Um, go to LinkedIn, figure out who you know that knows me um, and that can vouch uh, for you and can vet what you're doing and say, yes, this is worth Mark's time uh, to look at. And uh, that's the way the entire industry you know, really works. Excellent. Um, okay, good. So let's uh, open it up for questions, and I'll, I'll um, switch from James Lipton to uh, Phil Donahue. Um, you mentioned a lot of your companies have big data under the hood. Um, I've tried to start a few companies like this with varying success, but the big learning is big data is very time and effort intensive. The data is hard to massage from different places. It's not always clean data. It could lead you down a wrong path. So what have you experienced with the companies you work with and helping them get through what could be a, a very resource intensive phase, whether it's you know a year of time or lots of developers or the wrong data? How do you keep that as a manageable project to know whether it's going to work at all before you spend too much money? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I, I actually have kind of hated this terminology about big data uh, that's come about over the last few years. Oh, can I? Oh, you didn't hear the question? He, he was talking about the fact that he started a bunch of big data companies, and it's easy to go down, you know, basically rat holes, uh, spending a bunch of time um, and not being able to either be able to cleanse the data so that it's useful or find useful insights from the data, um, maybe merge different pieces of data together. And so um, how do you know, you know whether it's a good use of time? Um, well, as I started to say, I, one of the things I have not really loved is this whole idea of big data, um, because big data in and of itself is not a business. Um, there's nowhere I go to buy big data. If you're a company, you don't go you know, and say, hey, I'd like to buy some big data. Um, you go and buy insights from big data, right? <coughs> you buy, go and buy actionable um, information from big data, but you don't buy big data. Um, <coughs> and so, you know, when you're starting, quote unquote, a big data company, it's important you know the destination. What is the use of that big data? And is it feasible in which you can gather data that you can accurately massage and really glean some meaningful insights that are unique uh, in the marketplace? I don't know if that's helpful, but that's how I go. Questions? Is Okay, uh, two questions. One is when you were looking at Songza, how did they initially prove that their ad metrics would be better than the normal company's ad metrics? If it's, you know, if it's contextual commerce, I'd expect the uh, ad metrics to be much better than Facebook. Um, yeah, in, in, in fact, we didn't have that data when we were initially looking at it. What we had was big user uptake, which is one of the, when we're looking at a consumer-based business, um, we kind of chopped the market into sort of two types of companies. There are hardcore technology companies, and then there are uh, what I call execution companies. Most consumer-facing companies are execution companies. There's not really a true hardcore proprietary technology uh, in there. When we look at those types of companies, we insist that there's some kind of consumer traction that we can look at. So what we were really looking at was massive consumer adoption and usage uh, data. At the time, the idea of contextual commerce was strictly a notion that the company had and not something that they could prove to us. And, but you know, we're in the business of taking some leaps of faith. Um, and again, we knew the management team quite well, had a lot of faith in them, and watched them fail, actually, in their first iteration. Yeah, and have you what has been uh, the difference between regular ads and the ad value that you're seeing? on Songza, for example. So now that they are starting to crack the code on, on contextual commerce, they're getting significantly higher CPMs than you know, run of the, the mill you know, ads that would show up. And they still do some of that, so we're, we're still not the bulk of their uh, inventory sale, but stuff that does get sold you know, that has a contextual commerce is doing very, very well. Are you talking five, 10, 15 dollars? What, what's this? 
you know, I, I have to. I actually don't know the data. I just know that it's it's significantly higher. I don't, I don't know the exact prices. Love that idea, though. Um, okay. Also, um, how do you work out the valuation of these companies when you're looking at them? Yeah. What, how, is it just negotiation between the founder and you, or how do you work that out? Yeah, I mean, there. This is not a science. Um, you know. Uh, I have a Wharton degree, which is absolutely useless in terms of the valuation. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, when it's early, we're trying to strike a balance between risk and reward effectively. So we want the entrepreneurs to carry a significant um, equity ownership stake um, in the company. We know that they're going to get diluted over time, especially if they're successful, because while it may take a lot less uh, capital to start a company today, it still takes massive amounts of capital to scale a company. Um, that hasn't changed because most of the money is going into people. Um, and people cost you know, as much or more as they did 10 years ago. But the actual initial phases of a company um, can be done far less expensively. So typically in the, um, in the series seed rounds, which are typically sort of one to $2 million rounds, you see valuations. And this will vary by geography, by the way. Um, the Valley is much, much different than, than the East Coast. Um, of somewhere between three and six million dollars pre-money for a one to two million dollar round, then they get into their Series A. Depends on you know how much traction they've gotten, um, and that can be in the teens up to mid twenties, and then as you get into you know Series B, Series D, it really depends on the traction that the company has gotten. Okay, and last question I have, as far as um, obtaining users and members and people who come back to the site. Um, have you found that SEO works best, or is it more a matter of finding large groups and getting them to incite the members to, or their, their constituents to come to the site? Yeah, I mean, in today's day and age, if, if you can't build a consumer product that has a high degree of virality to it, you haven't built a very useful consumer product. If you have to spend a lot of money on you know, SEO or SEM, um, you know, you're fighting an uphill battle. Great. Thanks, Mark. So the question was, um, talk about some things that you know, didn't make it, why didn't they make it, was a management strategy. Um, so I've actually, throughout my career, done exhaustive studying of this because hopefully I'm a learning animal and, and I like to avoid the mistakes of, of the past. Um, and what we've typically found that the, the, the majority of failures, I've gotten much, much better, you know, early in my career I was probably not so good at picking management teams. Um, experience has, has gotten me a lot better about that. I think the biggest reason companies fail is what we call product looking for a market. Um, that they build product, they, they have a theory about what the market wants, but in fact, um, they haven't truly vetted it well enough, and they were completely wrong about whether they were really solving a big problem uh, for the marketplace. That's the biggest reason. How do you manage conflicts in your portfolio companies? Meaning like Chango, Tap Commerce, um, when you had Fetchback, they all have different products, but they really are kind of the underlying behavioral segmentation retargeting company. Like if Chango says, you know, we're doing search, now we have this new vertical we want to get into mobile, and you have another portfolio company in Tap Commerce. Like how do you manage conflicts? Uh, <coughs> that's a fair question. We will never knowingly invest in a company that is competitive with an existing portfolio company. So. When Chango and Fetchback were funded, they were both going after you know, different pieces of the ad tech stack, um, and they weren't competitive with each other. We had one situation where two companies looked like they were starting to converge uh, upon each other. And um, at the time, we had the same partner on both deals. Um, so uh, we basically separated, put a different partner on, on one of the deals, and, and kept a fairly tight, you know, Chinese wall, if you will, between the companies. But we don't go in trying to invest in competitive companies because we're so involved in the companies um, and we do not want to split our loyalty and you know, it's trying to pick which of your children you're going to help. So uh, I understand your macro strategy. It was a great slide. but and. Um, are there any particular trends or problems you see right now that you're looking 
that like if you saw something come across your desk in some particular segment, you'd really jump up and see that. You know, any any sort of more micro trends that you're looking at right now to put some money into or you think are going to be successful? No, I'm really looking for, you know, big markets that, you know, are ripe for some form of disruption, um, improvement, um, something that, that, you know, digital media can take advantage and, and cross with commerce. Uh, there's something that came across recently that I thought was a great idea, and w which was non-traditional lines of insurance, actually, um, are not sold online. Um, there's no kayak, if you will, for these types of insurance. Uh, and the old distribution channels of um, uh, sales forces are dying out, actually. Um, and it's very hard for these companies to actually recruit salespeople. So they, they're looking for different uh, modes of distribution. But that's a big market. Insurance is a giant market. Um, so I'm always looking for big things, not really micro things. When you talk about big vision, um, what's the best way to get across that you have a, a big vision without sounding stupid? Or like you're, you're, you're a little too dreamy, if you actually can back it up? Well, if, if you're playing in a big market, it's not that hard to have a big vision, uh, right? Um, <laughs> so if you're playing in, in the you know, $30 billion Google search market, or you're playing in the $300, million, $300 billion um, donation market, it's, it's not that big a stretch for me to think that if you've got a truly unique uh, product, that you might take you know, some small percentage of that, and that can be a very big company. Um, it's harder when you're saying, I'm playing in a $200 million market, and I'm going to build a $100 million business in a $200 million market. Th that lacks credibility. Greg, Greg, by the way, Greg is one of the guys who works here all the time. He's working <laughs> his ass. Thanks, Peter. And Peter's great, by the way. Innovation Center is fantastic. Um, so the... Um, what I want to th when you have a big idea and you say, okay, this is, a, I, in my case, I have a $100 billion market uh, of sporting goods. I have 180 million people in the United States alone who play sports, and I think the company will probably in three to four years have hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. How do you say that without sounding really goofy? That's, that, that's you know, without saying, okay, obviously it has to be executed, and you have to connect the right dots. At what point do you, can you actually say that with, with some kind of great faith? I, I think there's nothing wrong with sort of laying out a, a long-term macro vision of what the company can be. The timelines may be different, okay, right? The, the, the business plans all say this is going to be achieved in five years. Of course it's not. And that doesn't really matter to me. I just want to know that the possibility is that, you know, we can get to a very large company. How do I connect the dots? I start looking at the management team. What have they done before? Are they credible? Is this a rock star team, you know, or is it just a, you know, a couple of guys that, you know, you had a drunken uh, night last night and decided they were going to go do this, you know. Here's the back of the napkin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. So if we asked your portfolio company CEOs, what would they say you have metamorphic has brought uh, sort of a value add beyond the capital that you provide. I mean, I think you've, you touched on a couple in terms of name 50 companies and we'll work our asses off to introduce you to them, but uh, what other sort of value add would uh, your portfolio CEO uh, say you bring? Well, unfortunately, not every company um, works out um, the way you think it's going to work out. Um, and so it's not uncommon, especially within the management team that you've got to make some changes in the management team. An example or two, that the original founder um, isn't the guy that's going to carry the big vision to the full execution um, and needs to be moved out or moved up. Um, those are very, very difficult conversations to have. Um, I think that um, part of what I love about uh, my job is that it draws on every skill set that I have, and, and including uh, being a psychologist. Um, 
and uh, working through the interpersonal dynamics of, of team building and moving a, a founder on. And so um, I, I think, uh, you know, for me personally, I've gotten called a lot, uh, if you look at the board members, it ends up falling on my shoulders to, to sort of be the inside guy who's going to work the system to move a founder kind of on to the next level and let the company thrive. Um, and uh, that's an in a very important role. And if you were to ask the manage middle management teams, um, you know, that they would say thank you because that's not easy to do. Um, and, it's a th and, and in a way, it's a thankless job uh, that a lot of the other investors actually don't want to do. But um, it's part of what I like about the, the, the job, actually. So next question, everyone you know in startups eventually start talking like I'm ready to scale. I'm ready to scale. When are you actually ready to scale? Is it based off of your product can't honestly take an, uh, any more revenue or customers in because your team's not big enough, or is it based off of revenue itself? The, that's really the market pulling you you know into scale, right? So your product is either getting traction with consumers if it's a B2C product, or it's getting traction with you know businesses if it's a B2B product. And um, you know, I think you know intuitively that your your company is ready to scale. That you've hit the you know, what we call the product market fit, right? Um, you're selling a complete product. Um, you have a pricing model that you can replicate. I, I call it rinse, wash, and repeat. Once you get to a rinse, wash, and repeat, you know, kind of um, process within your business, and so you, every sale isn't a custom sale, uh, for example. Um, you're not price different. You know, there's not different pricing for every uh, customer. You've got a fairly standardized set of operating procedures, pricing, product delivery, customer service, etc. You're ready to scale. What's the maximum size of your? So we typically start out with a um, seed investment that will range from four to seven hundred thousand dollars, and then we will reserve another two to three dollars for every initial dollar that we put in. So ultimately, you know, out of a fifty million dollar fund, we are trying to have about twenty five to thirty investments, of which we know half of them will end up being big winners. Half of them, not so much. Um, the ones that are, we want to have a position of somewhere around two, possibly three million dollars against. And last, I noticed you co-invested several firms that were two of the companies. Do you work with these um, investment or other VCs on a regular basis? Um, yeah, but you know, it, it's we don't choose who we're going to work with based on just who do we like. Um, we choose who we're going to work with, with um, based on who can add value, um, and do we share the same values in building, you know, companies. Um, so if you look across our portfolio, there's actually a very diverse group of co-investors uh, because different co-investors bring different networks, skills, et cetera, uh, to different businesses. Last question: Have you been the lead investor on companies? Uh, many, yeah. I wanted to touch on uh, a question that's near and dear to my heart, and I know a lot of people in the room is, let's put it this way. What, when did you know, post dot-com bubble first, that, that there was something interesting actually happening in New York? What was the tipping point in your, in your, in your mind? You said, wow, you know, this could actually become um, a pretty exciting marketplace. Was there, was there an IPO? Was it a certain funding? That's a really good question. Um, I think what really sort of um, clued me in was um, New York City has what's called New York Meetup. Um, it happens the first Tuesday of every month. And it got started, I think, in 2003 or 2004. And at that time, there were 50 people that would attend every week. Right. Um, by 2007, 2008, we were up to about 500 people. And I think that was really the, the sort of key indicator that there had been a massive cultural shift uh, in New York that was embracing entrepreneurialism. 
Um, and that, that's why I'm so glad that you and Peter are, are doing this thing, because in order for you know, any community to build a, um, a tech ecosystem, it first starts with that cultural shift. Um, and I guarantee you that you know, this room was going to be too small a year from now um, to hold all the people that You heard it here first. Out. I like that. How about a big round of applause for the prediction? Let's make that happen, guys. Um, uh, excellent. Well, Mark, this is really fabulous. I, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the train up. Not so bad, right? And uh, we, we expect to be pulling a lot of smart people out of New York over, over time. So thank you very much for being here. And uh, everyone will be hanging out for a while. I'll, I'll turn on the songza in a little bit. You'll get to hear some more music. Um, so thanks, Mark.